All right. Um, we have one person who thinks for having me. I'm really happy to be here. 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 I
um, consequences for land and people in the north, especially. So um, this rationale then of extractivism is pervasive, right, to an extent that we're now kind of even looking to extraction for the for the solutions of the very symptoms caused by extraction. Um, and then I'm interested in how and why extraction is still kind of looked at um, in times of climate concern. So outspoken climate concern, as is the case with the green steel transition. So this idea of, um, so now we're becoming environmentalists, right, with green steel, but still extraction is focused, right, as, um, as an impetus for this transition. And so how is this extraction then narrated as, as a necessity in a way? Okay, then very briefly on Sweden, right? Sweden prides itself very much on being kind of this uh, mining hub, right? And a mining nation that provides Europe, um, the European market with especially iron ore um, and does so kind of in an environmentally friendly way is, is the idea right behind this environmental exceptionalism that Sweden kind of portrays in a lot of ways. Um, and... Um, a lot of uh, this extractive, the extractive activities in Sweden, mining, but also deforestation, water and wind power and, and other things, right, are happening in the Swedish North or in the indigenous Sápmi. Mm -hmm. And what kind of this Swedish sense of exceptionalism doesn't take into account are um, the colonial implication of a lot of these um, extractive industries, past and present, right, the, um, the impacts on, on people in the North. Um, all right, so from then being kind of this nation that prides itself on being an, um, a mining superpower, um, there has now been also this shift or an inclusion to also adopt this exceptionalism in terms of the transition of the heavy industry and then specifically green steel. Um, so kind of taking this international role as being um, a powerhouse also in that regard, right? And domestically that um, the goal is then kind of to have a seven to 10% re emissions reduction um, by introducing this technological shift from, from coal to hydrogen in steel production. All right, and that's um, very briefly on kind of my theoretical assumptions that I come into um, this dissertation with. So I understand, or in order kind of to understand this, what I refer to as an attraction to extraction in times of climate urgency, I suggest that the general body politic, and that's kind of this line in the middle here, right, is um, governed by the idea or the fantasy in kind of the psychoanalytical sense that extraction is a means to happiness. So in order to, um, to arrive at a happy future, right, we have to kind of orientate toward extraction as kind of this happy object um, of or an object of desire. So we are driven then in this kind of um, extractive order or in this rationale of extractivism by a promise that once we arrive right at this object that is here illustrated as this um, box in the, at the end of the tunnel, of the mining tunnel, right? Uh, so once we arrive at the object, happiness will follow. So, so um, this kind of also then suggests there is this regulatory power um, in um, of the extractive order, right, or of um, the extractive rationale to keep us in line and to desire as prescribed by the order. Um, and I refer to this as the comfort of alignment, right? So if you're aligned kind of with this order, conduct is kind of congratulated and it is a comfortable um, situation to be in as long as this um, path is kept free from obstacles and there you have this kind of red thing that is um, illustrating an obstacle and this could be for example a mention of sami rights or biodiversity or other things right and um i use here is Sarah Ahmed's the notion of the promise of happiness um, to theorize this orientation then toward extraction as an affective anticipation or um, an anticipation of a happy future. So once we kind of arrive at that in the future, um, we, we are being told that kind of we, um, we will be happy. So I think that's an important thing about this framing because um, that kind of gives an opportunity to frame 
um, this alignment with extraction or the rationale of extractivism as something that is also emotional. So it's also driven by a desire and not only kind of, um, as is often done, right, resistance is framed as emotional, as hysterical, as being kind of not rational, but also kind of framing um, alignment with extractivism as something that is um, that is based on a fantasy, a promise that is something that we are hoping for, right? Uh, so yeah, this is what I'm trying to do. And then these other lines um, then are those that kind of misalign, that step out of line or that have an altogether different kind of idea of what is desirable, what we need in the future in order to be able to be happy, basically. Um, all right. Okay, and then um, I do this in three empirical chapters in my dissertation. The first empirical chapter then looks at comfort, so comfort in alignment. So this uh, first row, right, of people that are kind of aligning with extraction. Um, and here I identify um, comfort by looking for linearity in storytelling. So how kind of there's some kind of lack perceived in society, maybe there's... Um, unemployment or something like that that people locally um, um, struggle with and then there's kind of this linear path from this lack toward um, the happy future right and then I kind of track this linearity in order to identify comfort in alignment okay so the first chapter then um, so the story as told kind of by these mining or green steel advocates goes like this Okay, metals and minerals are the building blocks of our modern lives, and steel is wonderful because um, it can be recycled infinite times, right? In fact, steel lives forever like Beyonce. This is one of the um, one of the things that uh, that is being said here. But our needs cannot be covered through recycled materials alone, and therefore we need virgin ore, right? So this is the the storyline here. And to uphold our standard of living then, um, and then our and us is of course referring to kind of this affluent community of a Western us, right? So then um, the need um, then for extraction, uh, sorry, I should have done this, yeah. So the need then for extraction is illustrated with a whole lot of imagery, right? For example, here, uh, camping in nature with a loved one, charging an electric car while eating a hot dog. We have um, preparing oneself to go to a party with friends and playing charades on a Friday evening with one's family. Like these imageries are kind of reoccurring in um, in the data. Um, there's also quite a lot of imagery about um, children, right? Children um, learning how to ride a bike or being on a swing and having fun, like things like that. Or a couple looking on um, on an ultrasound and looking at their fetus, right? Things like that. And all of this kind of inferring that none of this would be possible if not for kind of this trust and extraction. And then the story continues that um, the steel industry accounts for about 10% of Swedish emissions, which is too much in light of climate change. So here is this kind of narrative of climate urgency coming in. Coming in. And given um, that this is too much, we are part of the problem, it is being said, right? Uh, and then here this identification is, of course, being made right with um, the problem being coal-based steel production, right? So that is the problem, but now we can become part of the solution with hydrogen-based steel production, right? So kind of distancing oneself from this dirty uh, production process in the past. Um, yeah, and all of this, of course, starts in the mine. And without the minerals and metals then, and also this trust and extraction, we're told that we would have to return to the Stone Age, right? So one of my interviews here says we would have to sit in a cave and make a fire. But this is the idea that without these things being fulfilled, we can't have the life that we have now. So we have to um, kind of forfeit modernity and return to this pre-modern chaos of sorts. Um, and the green transition then is narrated as um, generally perceived as problematic, right, as difficult and uncomfortable. But with this green technological shift, um, the growth um, approach and kind of this consumption, consumption is living can be kind of combined with 
uh, with environmentalism, right? So this kind of gives a solution also to, we don't have to be uncomfortable. We don't have to live in a monastery. All right. Then the second empirical chapter, um, here I look at where linearity is broken. So first I kind of track linearity, right? To look at comfort. And then uh, in the second chapter, I look at where kind of these disturbances are um, in this comfortable linear storytelling by various obstacles, right? So these, these things that on, on the illustration was this red um, um, obstacle in the way of the line. And these obstacles to a large extent are Sami rights, uh, permit processes that are long, right? Uh, so that mining can't go ahead, but also these kind of um, not in my backyard questions or protesters and things like that. Um, and then I look at how do the people then deal with these obstacles that are placed in their in their way. And then, uh, well, there are different kind of approaches to kind of dealing with discomfort then. So uh, most commonly actors can reject the obstacle, right? Saying, for example, well, um, this isn't anything we need to deal with, right? And kind of refocus extraction and say, and kind of dismiss this obstacle as irrelevant, irrational, something like that. Um, others are kind of more, while well, they refocus extraction as the object of desire, but do, in, do it in a more reluctant way, in, in, a, in a way. So, um, for example, by noting, well, we don't, we know that this isn't great, but we need this. There isn't any other alternative, for example, right? So refocusing, but kind of there is discomfort still in this realignment. And then others, again, may reject extraction altogether. So kind of um, I look at how productive is discomfort in um, producing change, right? And to be honest, this isn't actually all that much in the data, but uh, one interviewee at least kind of told me that he was a minor all his life, but once he was in pension age, he didn't really see the point anymore because, um, well, there is so much negative things with extraction and now he doesn't really want to engage. He doesn't see. So there's kind of this, um, the perks kind of not no longer outweighing the harms of extraction. Okay, and I wanted to give some examples then. So um, for the kind of the, as framed as an obstacle, right, as the Sami uh, rights issue. So here, when I ask the pro mining and green steel interviewees about Sami rights, and this often doesn't come up um, if I don't introduce this question, right? So in this linear storytelling, there is no trace of the Sami basically. But then when I ask, oh, well, what about the Sami, right? Then this discomfort is introduced in a way. And oftentimes they say like, well, that this is important in principle, right? But so refocusing kind of extraction as the happy object by dismissing, right? And to do that by, um, for example, noting that the land claims that the Sami are making are uh, irrational. They are they claim too much land um, on, um, um, yeah, too much land relative to other interests, right? So saying, like, well, we have to coexist and the Sami can't claim all of this land basically. Uh, so, for example, one person here saying it's not like Sweden is covered by mines. Why shouldn't there be place for some mines, right? Things like that. And others um, present the Sami then as selfish, right? When they don't want to make these sacrifices to some land areas um, for the green transition and uh, municipal survival. So basically saying, well, um, they don't really want to help us, right, to transition and to make the municipality survive, like things like that. Uh, and then there's also this idea that coexistence, which is a very problematic term in itself, right? And which, which, is, which is critiqued quite a lot by the Sami as well, um, but that it would be possible if there was a will but the Sami really don't want, right, this, this kind of perspective. And then there's also outright racism in the data where kind of locals question who counts as Sami and who therefore is entitled, entitled to rights. Um, there are interviewees in um, the interviews that kind of question the bloodline of specific um, Samis in the resistance, for example. So calling them sidewalk Sami or wannabe Sami, noting kind of that they they aren't really Sami if you look at the, you know, things like that. Um, 
And all of this kind of as a way of dismissing their claims as irrational and dismissing the obstacle and refocusing extraction. Oh yeah, here's one um, quote saying, do we want mines somewhere, is anywhere okay? And where is it okay in that case? Is the reindeer this incredibly inflexible or what? Um, okay, and then um, briefly, I just wanted to say biodiversity is also framed as an obstacle uh, that kind of stands in the way for the green transition. And so in general, mining activities are kind of imagined as um, being separate and uh, at taking place at a great distance from, um, from nature. So, uh, for example, information videos kind of frame, they, they show this an image like that, for example, right, show a, like a lush nature and then kind of the camera shifts down into the mining tunnel. So kind of inferring that these are two realities that are very separate, right, and they don't really interfere with each other. So the mining tunnel um, is not um, having any impact on these um, on these natural environments. Um, but then when biodiversity kind of comes up as an issue, it is often stressed that green stands against green. So noting kind of that where there are things that are more important to focus on at the moment, which is of course the climate, right? According to these people, so the emissions reduction has to be prioritized and then things like one single plant or things like that can't stand in the way is the way that this is framed. And um, here kind of um, there's reference made to what they refer to as local nature. So for example, this single plant or a single mountain or things like that, um, but which they kind of merge with this not in my backyard concern. Um, so also kind of at the same time referring to kind of shadows over like the shadow of a windmill over somebody's backyard or things like that. Um, to kind of merge biodiversity as local nature um, and refer to that as not relevant in, in the light of, um, of climate change, um, if that makes sense. So kind of all nature, right, all biodiversity becomes a not in my backyard issue that can be dismissed in a way. Okay, and then uh, when it comes to reluctant alignment, um, I wanted to talk briefly about that, that as well. And that's when kind of um, local people have troubles with kind of these, for example, incisions in familiar environments or social impact of extraction, right? So for example, uh, when I went with one of my interviewees to this new green steel mill, which is um, mill, which is on the left. Um, so this is where the new steel mill will be built. Um, he said, soon you will have a nice view or nice and nice view. Damn, I don't know. At least you get a view of what's going on. Pretty sick view for someone who grew up here. So this kind of feeling of, well, this is, it's not great, but I kind of work with it and I'm proud of it as well. But um, it's, um, it's not really, um, yeah, it also hurts, right? And then they refer also a lot to the moving of cities as something that, um, that, creates a lot of discomfort. And that's the two other images that you see here. So here, for example, someone says, I'm damn torn. Sweden needs it, of course, needs mining. But the question is, with what consequences? And um, then one other issue that they take up a lot is this idea of kind of the North being framed and treated as a resource colony for the South, where kind of the region is left, they say, as an un unattractive hyper-masculine society, and they refer to as as, a, as barrack towns or Russian labor camps. And then one of my interviews says, in this way, the North becomes a pantry where others come and get things, right? So this idea. And then another one says, if you were to build a wall across Swe Sweden, you would see where the claw marks are, right? So this, this idea that um, um, there is no appreciation either for uh, what you kind of contribute. Okay, and then the third chapter, which I won't go into today, um, but that deals more with kind of the misaligned, right? So the desire lines that, or the kind of alternative objects of desire that are identified by the misaligned or the killjoy to go with Sarah Ahmed. Um, and here, for example, those can include kind of emphasis on other than monetary values, uh, other pathways and growth, more emphasis on care-based trade of services with local community, 
small scale and long term solutions, right? So this idea of kind of localizing and small small scale stuff, um, locally integrated green transformations that center on systemic change, right? So more kind of radical ideas of uh, what green means in a way. And what is interesting as well here is that even among um, some of the aligned or, or the misaligned, sorry, the killjoy, there are these traces of alignment. So traces of kind of going back to extraction to say um, uncomfortably so, but still kind of saying, uh, well, we don't want extraction, but there is we I, I like my computer or things like that. Right. So as in their role as consumers, kind of going back to the importance of extraction on a certain level. Yeah, um, I'm over time anyway. So thank you so much for listening. And um, yeah, looking forward to discussing this with you. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone comment? I just a big comment. I was the first in between that one by from Boden. Um the first is Boden, exactly. Okay. Yeah. By a huge area. It's really big, yeah. Uh, it also surprised me a bit that but they want to kind of build this um st new steel city. So it's quite um huge area of land. What was it that you went there for? Well, it was a shop for with um, some artists that uh, get into you know the landscape and kind of imagining the forest and mm -hmm. work and kind of forest like mm -hmm. cool. what do they take with us? Yeah, yeah. great. So are they going to be like new units, not to change the old one? Yes. Well, why is that? I think it's a different um, process that is needed. I mean, on the technical sides, I have some people that know these things better, but Valentin, for example, knows these things, but um, I think it's a new, uh, they need a, they have to exchange the blast furnace and do a new process of sorts. Mm -hmm. So I don't think you can just replace that aspect of it. So will they close down the old ones or? I don't think so, no. Where is, it, where is it located, this union? Um, well, there are two different ones. So one is a state-driven uh, or state um, company, state-owned company-driven one, uh, which is located in Jellevaria. Uh, and then there's this one in Budan, then, which is a corporate uh, project. So it's two uh, projects at the moment. There's some questions from the chat. Yes, let me try. How is the audio now for people in the chat? Um, we can't really hear when it's not uh, Georgia talking, unfortunately. Uh, there was a couple of statistics that I thought would be interesting to unpack because um, you said that the the aim for the for the green steel is to reduce the emissions by seven to ten yeah. percent. Um, and you also said that there's like um, the green steel or, or something else. There was a there's like a 40, 40 to fifty percent increase in energy mm. needed. Mm. So I'm wondering, like, oh, could you unpack that a little bit? I'm wondering if it is the projection like that the the increase in energy will be energy that will be that needs to be created for yeah. What, what's the well, in terms of the energy, they talk about um, wind power, especially um, in order for it to be green hydrogen. Um, so they have talked about wind power mostly. Um, then, I mean, I don't know if it's feasible and all of these things and if the land kind of is enough and all of these issues mm -hmm. and if uh, municipal vetoes and, and all of these things when those things come in. Um, so, yeah, I mean... The, this linear story that I presented here, right? I, I don't really make any truth claims to that, right? It's just like what people say. So I'm looking at the narratives of that. Um, the same, same with like the 7 to 10% um, emissions reduction thing is today the steel industry accounts for 7 to 10%. So just then they say, well, we want to um, decrease 
emissions in Sweden by 7 to 10 percent because that's what the steel production or steel industry accounts for today sure. so it's very kind of this simple kind of a translation of what um, the shift would translate into it's like there's a there's a bunch of numbers that they can put out which don't necessarily add up or make yeah. sense but they they have yeah to claim to make claims numbers for... are i think um something that people often like in these contexts use right to make it sound very <laughs> valuable in a, in a lot of ways did you find that most people are happy with this change in northern sweden or not or um well the, now that so these two chapters that I presented now is people working with these things, right? Locally or um, the industry people, right? The official industry storytelling and all of these things. So obviously they are very um, content um, in a lot of ways. But then um, the local people that, so this slide on the reluctant alignment that I talked about in the end, there, there is, is a lot, lot of friction there, there as well. And um, there there is this sense of well we this resource colony idea and all of all of these aspects to it right and um, and kind of the harm that is being done by extraction right i had one instance i interviewed a um, um, former mine worker and i sat at a cafe and then like a truck with timber went by and he's like okay so now i can't walk in the forest today either like things like that right they're like frustrated with what the region is turning into because of extraction as well um, but then Kind of work with extraction related things a lot of a lot of the time as well so kind of have to rationalize and navigate in this space i think um but then there are also a lot of people who are against it which is in the last chapter so the resistance part of it um which is of course necessary i think if you present it like this it sounds like oh everybody wants this right which is not the case of course they need to increase the amount of biono that is extracted because of these new steel plants. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so they talk about 50% um, virgin ore and 50% recycled. Um, and given kind of the increase in production, that would still um, result in quite a, quite a lot of more ore needed. But I, I don't have the numbers um, with me, but um, yeah, so extraction would have to increase. And an interesting thing, so the mine that I'm looking at, it's not a mine yet, it's a planned mining project that was super controversial for a long time. And now this idea of, well, this could actually be part of the green steel transition comes in, right? So then this very controversial mining project, which has been, um, they tried to get um, the exploitation uh, permit for that for years and years right and now they're talking about well this is necessary this mine is necessary for the green transition so and then it got kind of um the go-ahead by the state as well using this idea of green steel so there you can see kind of how these things kind of interlink but the steel companies don't really want to talk about otherwise extraction as something that has to feed this transition so there is kind of this distancing from extraction as well going on yeah in a way but then of course like in the it's called the hybrid project right that is the state um the state company driven one um and they're one of the companies that are in the consortium is a mining company of course so then they talk there about well we are um, doing mining as green as possible right and as um and um well i can just so this this idea here is to mine with nature right to so while they say like when you mine obviously there's zero biodiversity at this point right but once you um can return the land to um, to kind of mother nature, right? You can kind of um, give it give it back, and there is kind of the symbiosis happening, and right. And so there's this idea of temporality there that it's only for now, and then we can kind of restore and all of these things. 
Um, so they talk about biodiversity a bit, um, but they talk about it in that kind of sense, in this placing placing biodiversity concern kind of in the future, in a sense. And that's object of so that's also Sarah Ahmed and she talks about kind of this um uh, the affect I mean I work with affect and emotion um and um kind of to try to frame this as something that is affective given kind of the objects that we tend to move toward uh, is kind of high um, signaling an intent behind so there's an intention behind the way that kind of we orientate and if um if we see kind of proximity to extraction then that would indicate then that there is kind of an affective anticipation of enjoyment in as a result um so that's kind of the idea of of this framing of a fantasy right so there is this promise that once um once we kind of extract right we will get jobs we will get all of these things municipalities will flourish and uh and this this whole idea right, right? but then is is this really what is happening right so in the data there is a lot of um, times people, people talk about kind of past extractive projects that don't yield these yeah. um like don't manifest these promises right so for example in yokmok there's quite a lot of water power right water power dams um, which has resulted in a lot of jobs during construction, right? And then it went down again quite a lot. And they talk about that phase as wanting to get that back. But then, so giving promise kind of back to extraction in a way, while it didn't work before. So there's kind of an interesting dynamic of this idea that extraction will save us, but then referencing things that where it didn't save anything right so yeah it, i think it's an interesting um yeah there's a lot in the data as well um to unpack thanks for the question sold us this providing the fantasy something we don't yet have or like mm. the, the things but then at the same time that you need it in order to upkeep what we have now and that we lose the things now yeah so there's like this <laughs> so do you know where this hydrogen steel would go? Is there like a specific market for that or um, I don't um I don't know actually, but I mean they they the consumer that they target at the moment, right, is the automotive industry. Um, more generally, I don't know if there's already kind of a, there's already buyers, I know that, but I don't know where exactly. Um, but I mean, they target the automotive industry quite aggressively. Hmm. Yeah. So this new technology, is it like developed by who? Is it like a specific company and who, who, who would like then be able to sell those new hydrogen steel technologies abroad? No, so Hybrid has developed, developed this. So this consortium of these three Swedish companies has uh, developed this um, um, approach, I think. But I think it also also was there already, but wasn't market marketized, right? Wasn't feasible. Um, so they they talk about right. This technology, technology has happened. already been there, but we haven't really been able to do anything with it because it was too expensive, which now is apparently changing. Because of cheaper electricity or uh, market demand, I think. And is it's like a ten percent decrease in emissions coming from the not usage of coal. Yeah. Mm. So then the byproduct would be water, is what they say, right? So they have also this, um this imagery right of like commercials of um um like 
so oh, okay. they talk about hydrogen based seed production and then they have like a water bottle where it says pure waste right so it's only water that is like the waste product of this is the idea i mean i don't know how feasible that is either but get some carbon credits or are they involved in this carbon offsetting species mm, not sure chat mm -hmm. mm. Uh, no questions but just comments that it was a good presentation <laughs> thank you oh, yeah. yes thank you very much uh, are you aware of uh, like the situation here that they are actually planning one hour from Helsinki at the Norwegian startup company last year planning uh, site that is uh, looks uh, similar to the border to the edge uh, to the green steel. Okay. No. One hour west by the coast. Are you aware? Is that the one you mentioned? Yeah. Inco. Inco, yes. I'm actually I I'm an organic farmer from Inco. Mm -hmm. We are like organizing ourselves. Not the okay. farmers only, but I mean the the locals. Yeah. <laughs> so. How is the project now? Is it going forward? Or is it just speculative still? No, no, it's uh, they have already like really the uh, uh, like plans that are really on paper and, and they have the like the EVA. Um, yeah, the environmental assets. Yes, mm. yes, it's like an ongoing process. Yeah. yeah. Well, where is that place is it like destroying forests or uh, yes it's also it's like the the old uh, bottom uh, is owning let's say like 70 percent of, uh, of the area they had a uh, um, aircraft track there before it, it's like, like a industry a place for industry it will be so much bigger so they will need more land for it it's like mm. uh, 260 hectares and it's so so it's it's an uh, industrial place already place so like hard to to to, to say something against it because, uh, and, uh, but yeah it, it the plans look uh, very similar to the age to the mm. here in, in Boden. Mm. and we have had like meetings with the company already they like they are already there and they have people employed in like local people and so 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 do, do the people resist that or how is the situation? Um well, it's hard because we have some some like very popular politicians that, that are really uh, driving this forward and and they, they came out in, in, in the media, like everybody likes uh, this now. Uh, because this it's is really good, as you as you said, that this is really good for our society. We look at this and that mm -hmm. and blah and blah. And, uh, but actually, we don't have any problems with uh, unemployment or, or anything. <laughs> so I can understand what they are doing in Norwegian because they have a different situation mm -hmm. with unemployment. So, do you know where, where they, they get the uh, iron ore? Sorry? Is it where they, they get the iron ore from? The, I, the, the iron metal? And they said like 50% will be recycled. Mm -hmm. And then maybe fifty percent from where? And, they, and then they are also talking about uh, like the wind uh, energy that, uh, that that we have to to. And and there are plans in Finland for for building wind energy, mm -hmm. but the local people we we don't understand how big this is. So somebody can ask me that where will, will the windmills be? But it's not a question about the fuel. We will, they will be like, <laughs> we don't understand yet how, how 
how it will affect not only our our community there, but I mean the whole the whole uh, area for like class of body and going for community. Yeah. How I have understood is is that they use so much electricity that now that they built the new windmills in Finland and the idea is very great. Power plants, steel plants, they will use the new. Like that. Like one tenth or something. Yeah, and it will be. <laughs> there are a lot of uh, even. Associated deforest. Station comes also. That's but also. Is there something else you would like to ask from us, or what kind of comments would you like to? Have? Mm, I mean, no, just interesting to hear your reactions, right? I'm, I guess, at the end stages of my dissertation, so I guess it's nice not that there's nothing that's like this doesn't work <laughs> at all. Um, at least you can say it, so that's <laughs> good. Um, but no, just nice to discuss with you and um, keep keep discussing maybe going forward as well. I don't know, I'm, I'm just a little such a fan of, of using kind of like similar theoretical frameworks that are in study like the global south to just to study places like the Arctic and Canada and, and kind of like the Russian soil at global north and, and just kind of i don't know bringing up the idea that this is a, about a more general specific kind of way of organizing the world and not only mm -hmm. geopolitical issues or like state centers or like states interacting with other states but, yeah. thank you there's um <clears throat> there's one person in in sweden now that is one um how do i translate his title but he's like um um set like hired by the state to kind of um um identify problems with industrial expansion sort of kind of um and he has talked about sometimes he illustrates kind of the um what is happening in the north like all of these uh, industrial expansion things as like, like a map that is turned upside down so sweden being now kind of the new south is the new north and then he talks about like in globally there may be kind of this idea that the south is um is, is a certain area where it is poor and all of these things he says this and historically this has been the case in the north of sweden uh, as he as he points it out right and um, but now this will be turned upside down so with this green transition there is kind of this hope of um, re-envisioning the north as the new center of sweden because this is where it happens and then the former um Minister of Business has also said, like, uh, you have to wear sunglasses when you go to the north because here is the bright future. It's like things like that, like this the core and periphery dim dimension that is happening in um, within Sweden as well, and how that is kind of being reinvented in in a way, as also, also maybe a, a way of kind of accepting these things in the north, I guess.
something else. <laughs> audience from. Did you spend any time with with um like any of the any communities who were actively like existing and uh, or groups um joy mm. talk a, a bit more about because maybe there was not enough time in the present yeah no i didn't um i think it's also the chapter that is least developed in my dissertation so i didn't really i've written it but i've not written the conclusion <laughs> of it yet. Um, but no i've i've done um like that is i guess half of my data that i presented now or like half of the people that i talked to and then i've also talked to um people that are vocally kind of resisting and then mainly that related to uh, people that resist the mining project um, because that is kind of very mobilized it's very organized this resistance there um, and then kind of more general um, discontent kind of maybe with the green steel transition in the or in the green transition generally and then kind of specifying steel in a later stage kind of but um, the green transition in a general sense as kind of framed as green colonialism and as um, kind of this harm on the environment and so on and the, the effects of that. Um, so yeah, a lot, a lot of them Sami people, um, but also oh. uh, environmental activists, both locally, but also those that kind of come to the north kind of to protest the mine, for example. Um, yeah. How did you find this? Well, um, for this mining project, they're very organized. They have like these Facebook groups, and they, they have been, um, like mobilizing for ten years more. Um, so there, um, I contacted two people who were like the leaders or have had a lot of like a big role in organizing this group, um, and from that kind of being referred further and like contacted people that I've seen have engaged in protests and have like vocally, like all of these people are very like outspoken critics. Um, but um, yeah, then from kind of people who refer me also then I've talked to people who are um, not as visible, but still have an opinion about these things, right? But I think that was also um, nice to get in these perspectives as well. Not only the people who stand on the street, but also the ones who um, have very interesting perspectives on what an alternative future may look like, but don't mobilize in the same um, sense. But of course, they're less um, easy to get at in a way from like the start, but then spending some time there being referred further. Yes. Yeah. Right. So thank, thank you. So it's great to have you here, and we will be here for this too. So yes. There's, uh, today at five, there will be a session in corner in Venice about the uh, battery problems, about battery plants in Finland. And then we will have the events on the following days by itself and many other kind of issues. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, thank you for having me again yeah. and for coming. Right.